Next we have something that I know is extremely important and um, I know we're going to end on a high note. So this is about the opioid settlement monies. We have a spell. Mr. Feinmel there. We do. Mr. Feinmel, Laura Toddy, Andrew Newby, William Pye, and Ty Parr are going to take us home on this final presentation. So without further ado, Mike. Thank you, sir. Uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Batokas, Manager, uh, Chief Tratina, thank you again for giving me an opportunity to come and talk about uh, these issues, this, this plan, and, and uh, some of the work that we've done. Uh, if you remember a few weeks ago, I came uh, to a work session and we talked about the opiate abatement settlement lawsuit, or the opiate abatement lawsuit and the subsequent settlement and some of the funds that are coming. Mr. Newby uh, will be kind enough to step up in a few minutes and talk a little bit more about the settlements themselves, the, the funding streams that we've been talking about. But since about September, the county became aware of the fact that as a plaintiff in the lawsuit that we were looking at a certain amount of funds to become to be expended for the purpose of abating the issues that were created uh, as a result of, of the issues that led to the opiate lawsuit. And uh, the manager asked the, the group that you're going to hear from today to begin working on some plans. And, and we really focused our plans as that we had to be good stewards uh, of this funding. We, we were aware and, and we in the county have been sort of at the forefront of, of trying to address the issues that were created going back to, to 2016 and 2017 uh, and, then, and then working a little bit more towards with the recovery roundtable that uh, Mr. Brannon and, and Reverend Nelson uh, chaired. Uh, but we really wanted to come up with some plans, uh, put the work in to uh, try to make this better, to, to try to fix the, the difficulties that were, that were occasioned on our citizen and try to abate as, as the uh, authority sets out as its goal the issues that have come. So to start this analysis, uh, I went back and, and I looked at the recovery roundtable recommendations. Um, and, and it's significant to note that the recovery roundtable report came out February 10th of 2020 and created the recommendations that you see on the screen in front of you. Uh, and a month later, everything changed. And, and at the time that this report was completed, at the time that we discussed these recommendations, uh, we were loaded for bear. We, we had a head of steam. We were ready to go and implement uh, the recommendations that we came up with. And then our world changed, our, the criminal justice system changed, the approach changed, and how we had to address things was different. So we're, we're getting back on track, but I would also submit to you that we've done yeoman's work while dealing with issues created by the pandemic. And, and Sheriff is here. Her work has been absolutely tremendous, and she has been an active role in the efforts that, that we've gone through. So I'm not going to uh, go through each one of the recommendations, but I'm going to focus on a few of the recommendations uh, at this point because I think it helps frame where we go from here. And, and that's really what we're here to talk about today. Where do we go from here? What ideas do we have? What is the, the work of, what's the result of the work that we put in? Uh, what are the plans? For, for going forward. So the first recommendation was to change the name of the Heroin Task Force. Heroin Task Force was formed again around 2017 uh, in response to the issues that we saw in our community. But in 2020, the recommendation was to change the name of the Heroin Task Force to the Addiction Task Force. Uh, I would submit to you that, that, again, we were ahead of the curve on this. Um, what we did not know that we now know was that there is a, a really con a, a mix uh, of substances now, that, that we're seeing now fentanyl mixed in with, with stimulants, mixed in with traditional drugs that are not considered to be opiates. So there really is not the delineation between the type of drugs that maybe existed at that time. In 2020, our focus was on the fact that addiction is not a one-size-fits-all approach, and we can't just focus on one drug, heroin. We should focus on addiction as a comprehensive problem for our community. A few years later, we now know that fentanyl is mixed in with everything and is instigating many, many more of our problems. Um, so, so again, I just say that we were ahead of the curve. Many of our efforts since 2020 with the Addiction Task Force have really focused on the hodgepodge of drugs that, that we're faced with and even treating alcohol as a component of addiction and not just focused on, on heroin. Uh, drop down, one of the uh, bullet points you'll see is the concept of exploring the advantages of outsourcing drug testing. 
Well, that's something we did, and, and we actually found that um, some of the drug testing that we were already outsourcing, uh, i.e. for drug court and i.e. for community corrections, that was working. But implementing it across the scale and bringing in other, uh, other county organizations, for example, and RICO Mental Health, it just was not feasible to do that. So we took the advice, we did the exploration, we worked through the process, and found out that there was not any more advantage to changing our process other than what we were doing at that time. Um, next, you'll see maintaining an updated inventory of organizations and resources for treatment and recovery. That's something that I think we've done very well, but we're gonna come back and look at it a little bit more. We're gonna see where we've come from and then see what we can do better. The county does maintain a website. It's called Bounce Back HC. Um, in 2023, we're gonna be in the process of looking at should we reboot that website? Should we create, recreate a different visually appearing website? And should we make information more readily available on that? So we are gonna take that and several of the other recommendations of the recovery roundtable and go forward with them. Um, two go together, the, the concept of establishing contractual agreements with approved recovery residences and financial assistance for individuals seeking admission to approved recovery residences. Uh, my predecessor in this role, Mr. McDowell, liked to use the terminology, the good housekeeping stamp of approval. Uh, what really he was talking about was creating a process of reviewing our community partners, where folks were leaving our jail, leaving Henrico Mental Health, leaving the court system and going. Uh, was there oversight that we could provide with that area? And, and that's something that we've done a very good job with. Uh, fire marshals are involved with inspection. Police are involved with communicating about the various recovery residences. We're making sure that when folks are leaving the jail, leaving the court system, leaving in Rico Mental Health, leaving drug court, and connecting with these recovery residences, they're going somewhere safe. They're going somewhere where they're secure. They're going somewhere where services are being provided. Uh, that comes under the heading of a program that's called the CHIRP program. And the CHIRP program has a second component to it, which is funding for folks to go. And we, we use the word scholarship, although we put that in air quotes, for folks to go to these recovery residences. Uh, this program, I'm gonna tell you in a second, has, has a great deal of success. Um, 75 people have participated in the program and 83% of the folks who have participated in the program have stayed for either two or four weeks. And that's what we begin to imagine as a success. But I'll tell you the, the success goes beyond numbers. Um, in preparation for the efforts that we're doing here today, I've talked to drug court and I've talked to folks that work for Enrico Mental Health and they labeled the CHIRP program as a game changer. They say that the ability to provide secure housing, safe housing, as a first component with the efforts that, they're, that they are marrying them with has been a game changer for the success rates of the work that they're doing. So that may not be something that shows up on a, on a spreadsheet. That may not be something that shows up on data, but we certainly have had a feel with our partners that are working in this area that the CHIRP program has been a resounding success. So we're not gonna kill, overdo data uh, this morning, um, but we do want to look at some of the data that we have been tracking uh, through the Addiction Task Force and use that data to inform the use of funds for our future product projects. When we created the Recovery Roundtable, we were in response to a crisis or two crises. crises. One crisis being the devastation that opiates and that drugs were having on our community, the other crisis being the fact that our jail population had exploded and then was outstripping what our resources were. Uh, we went through over a course of, of nine months, and again, with the leadership of the members of this board, we went through a, over a course of nine months, various concepts, various ideas, various approaches to how can we address both of these crises. And what we found from listening to our judges was that they were using jail as a place to hold people who they weren't confident with releasing into the streets because of their addiction. Uh, we heard from both the circuit court level and the general district court level, judges say, we're worried that folks are going to leave our court and go out and overdose. And so we are not confident to release these folks into the community. Therefore, our only option is to keep them in jail. 
And as a result, the jail population went up, 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 and got us to crisis level. Um, the chart that you see in front of you shows that um, we have reduced that number. Uh, and, and we're not at the crisis of the jail population that we were before. Now, obviously, the, the key factor there, the key variable, is what happened in March of 2020. And that huge drop uh, in numbers that occurred in March of 2020 um, has maintained somewhat consistent. Um, I was concerned with my previous job that we were going to see once we started evolving out of the pandemic that we were going to see those numbers going up again and we were going to be back in a crisis. And you'll see the trend from March of 2020 up until January of 2021 was that upward trend. Then we had a second adjustment to the jail population and that were some significant changes in the law. Uh, larceny offenses that uh, were at a certain value of the amounts, as well as compound larcenies were reduced from felony charges to misdemeanor charges by the Commonwealth of Virginia. Laws concerning probation violations and the amount of punishment that judges could impose for certain types of probation violations change. And so these changes that occurred in spring of 2021 resulted again in a second decline uh, in the number in the jail population. So th the good news, if there is good news out of this, is that we have maintained our population with our jail and not started to reach what we were at crisis levels before. What we are seeing, and, and, and this chart in front of you shows that at least through 2022, there is a consistency um, with the jail population, a spike during the summertime, uh, going into fall, the, there was a decline again. What we are seeing and what we'll address a, a little bit further in this presentation is that the difficulty exists that it's a lot of the same people that are in and out, in and out, in and out of jail. And I've talked to you about that previously in, in at least two different settings. Um, we're seeing folks with not committing serious crimes, not committing violent crimes, um, committing what we would call nuisance crimes, drug possessions, larcenies that are in jail for a couple months, out of jail. Out, for, out of jail for a couple months, in jail for a couple months, out of jail for a couple months. And it's a cycle that we can't break. And, and the sheriff and I and others have spent hours and hours and hours talking about this cycle and talking about concepts of trying to figure out a way to break this so that we can connect people um, with services directly but not have that same revolution of in and out, in and out, in and out. So we want to use this opportunity to try to address that and look at that in different ways. The next couple slides give you an indication that, that, and I think I would argue that it shows that our efforts are working. Uh, and, and I think Laura Toddy, Henrico Mental Health, deserves a tremendous amount of credit, as well as other folks involved, the police department, the fire department, the collective group of people working together. Um, it, it, the, the chart above you shows that overdoses, as a metric to measure our successes, we seem to be doing a better job. And that's one of the biggest difficulties that we have in this area with our efforts that we're working on. What are our success metrics? How do we know what we're doing is right? How do we know where we're having success? And, and I don't know. There's, there's not an easy answer to that, but I think this gives us some indication that we are showing some steps in the right direction. Um, to look at it a different way, looking at, at FIRE's data, we found that for a while in 2022, doses of Narcan, the drug that's administered to overcome an overdose, was elevated, but then started to decline again. So um, we're showing that there seem to be some positive gains. Uh, then we get to this slide, uh, which are the fatal overdoses for, for 2021 and 2022. And you see that there's a spike. Um, and, and oftentimes, that's not something that's under the control of anybody that's working in this area. Um, a type of drug, a type of drug mixed with a type of fentanyl, um, something coming onto the streets that we can't control, those are, are, are variables that can cause an increase in fatal overdoses. What our obligation is, is to be on top of this and to communicate, to communicate amongst fire, 
amongst mental health, amongst the police department, communicate with other jurisdictions, and make sure we know. And one of our, our goals for next year is to continue that pathway of communication so that if fire and police are sensing that there's a potential problem on the streets, they make the partners with Enrico Mental Health aware even more so than they're already doing, and a response is developed to see if we can cut this off. So you would look, and up until, um, or at least from March until July, it looked like we were going in a positive direction, then obviously a variable jumped in, that variable changed uh, and, and, and knocked up the numbers, but then we're back towards what we hope will be a positive end to, to on, on this particular metric to on the year. Um, so I asked Ms. Toddy to come up and talk about some of the successes of the diversion programs. Good morning. Thank you for having us today. So the, um, one of the, the things that Mike was just talking about is, is, um, is measures. And, uh, you know, we were asked early on in the, the pandemic. Um, we couldn't implement all the recommendations from the recovery roundtable. But were there some things that we could do to jumpstart the recommendations? And one of the things we were able to do is to look at our jail diversion programs. So um, we work with individuals um, that are in the, in the jail. They're all from Henrico County Jail. We develop a diversion program, a diversion plan with individuals. Um, most of the folks live in Henrico that are in our, our diversion program, 70%. We do have some that are in Richmond, Chesterfield, and Hanover. We continue to work beyond the boundaries of, of Henrico County to be able to serve them because we're trying to satisfy the, the court um, and not have them come back to, um, to Henrico Jail. If folks are going further away, like to Fredericksburg, what we do is we develop a comprehensive plan. We make sure that they have um, appointments and, and connect them to whatever jurisdiction that they are living in. Before an individual is released from jail, the clinician spends a whole lot of time working with the, the individual um, to assess the, the um, stages of change if the person ready to make some changes, to make sure that they're taking medication if they're on medication, to develop a really solid discharge plan so that when they are in the community, they are successful. We have two programs. Um, one is for mental health, one is for substance use. And you can see that the, you know, we do have good outcomes. I do have to say our numbers are small, so they're not a large number of folks. So on mental health in um, 2021, we had 19 um, were successful out of 23, and this year we're at 28 out of 29. On substance use um, in 21, it was 12 out of 23. This year, so far, we're 11 out of 17. So again, small numbers. What the case managers do is they really provide intensive level of services to the individuals that are coming out of jail. So on the mental health side, they'll see them at least weekly. Um, they will, where it's, it's a heavy community um, service uh, provision. So we're making sure that they're connected with community services. We, if somebody is, is duly diagnosed, then we have drug screens. We make sure that they're going to the, to the doctor and they're taking their medication. On the substance use side, the case managers are spending between three and five hours a week with the individual. In addition to that, they go to an hour of individual therapy. They go to three hours of group therapy. Most are on um, taking medication, so they're seeing the doctor and, and the nurse. Um, 90 to 95 percent live in a recovery home. You heard Mike just talk about the benefit of the CHIRP program. And this is one where we, we really find a lot of success. When they're in the recovery home, they also have um, responsibilities there. So they're attending groups. If they don't have a job, then they, they are going to their day program. Their drug screens, we do drug screens. All the individuals are being followed by CCP. Uh, they do drug screens. Uh, and the, residents, the um, residential recovery home also does drug screens. One of the, the things that helps um, these individuals is it's a lot to coordinate when you're, when you're coming out of jail. Um, and so the case manager is that consistent link. They go to every single appointment with the individual to make sure that they get there and make sure they're following all the recommendations. We do have some folks that relapse, and that doesn't mean that that's going back to jail. It really means looking at the, 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 um, the plan uh, and really trying to develop a higher level of treatment. So if somebody's in a recovery home 
For example, they might go into a residential program or they might go to a partial program um, or, or something like that to make sure they get that more intense level of services. Oh, went the wrong way. Let's go. I have a quick qu a question sure. for you um, about that. One thing I'd noticed, um, and you, you pro oop, you're probably going to get to this, um, the people who are in these programs, and I'm, I'm been following drug court for years, just and so that's where my ex, um, experience has come. Um, people are great when they know that the judge is going to check on them or they're going to have a drug test, and you've listed all this help that they're getting. And I know, are you going to tell us about what happens once they get out of the program and how long you've had many people out of the program? Because it worries me that often, we'll, you said they'll, the same person will. I'll say fall off the wagon, but not necessarily commit a crime. But our goal here is to get them off the, the drugs. Right. So, I mean, you're going to show us some statistics on that? So these are the folks that are successful. So this, okay. is, this is the numbers we have, with again, with that small number of folks. That, okay. that if you, if what we have found, that if you provide that intensive level of service, mm -hmm. you follow them for 6 to 12 months intensely, um, then they have been successful. Okay. Well, thank you. <laughs> sure. Uh, actually, Ms. O'Man, if I could take mm -hmm. that question. I think that um, I agree with you 100%. And I think that one of our approaches with the Addiction Task Force going forward is to develop the one-year, two-year, five-year patterns and, and to see what's working and not working with that. Um, the one thing that we, and I agree with you 100%, the one thing that we know is that the longer we can keep people engaged, the more success they're, they're likely to have. And it, this is all new, and, and I think that part of what we really want to accomplish with our data mining is to be able to look at those long-term successes and see, okay, this approach has resulted in five years of success, so we know this is working. That's exactly what I was looking for, and but you can't, you don't have five years yet. No, ma'am. But, so you're doing, following them as much as possible. It just, um, it, it always would upset me that I'd, well, I was gra glad that the person was in drug court and graduating, but their family was there and their children and that sort of thing. And you can see how this, how many people this actually impacts. So that's why I was wondering how long can you keep this up? All yes, right. ma'am. Yes, Thank you. Okay. So the, the, the slides that follow this one um, will be the recommendations that we have. Um, and so again, these are the re recovery roundtable recommendations. Um, again, we started positions as we were able and, and used one-time funding. For example, our jail diversion substance use case manager was funded with federal COVID funding. Um, that will be ending this year. And so then we will tap into the money that you have allocated um, for the Addiction Task Force to continue some of these positions. So the next slides will be around um, peer recovery, uh, jail-based diversion, substance use, uh, division director, um, improving our um, outreach in communities, uh, looking at, at um, pregnant and parenting women, and mobile crisis. So the money for, so the personnel, you're saying this is the next step? Yes, sir. And the funding is coming from the budget, not from other, other, other money? Correct. Correct. Okay. We're going we're gonna to use the, the, um, the direction that we have gotten for the opioid abatement money is really um, additive services, not continuing services. Okay. So... Do you feel confident that we're going to be able to find these people out in the field? Well, for some of these positions, we already have them. So they're working and, and, um, and, and doing a, a good job. It's just the, the transfer of the funding from one-time funding to, um, to permanent funding. Okay. It is a challenge to find people. You're absolutely right. I'm going to turn it over to Andrew Newby. Thank you, Laura. Madam Chair, members of the board, Mr. Manager, Ms. Tratina. So the next two slides, and I'll actually take them in reverse order, should be familiar to you. They were reviewed at your work session on November 9th. This is the opioid uh, settlement money. This is the additive money uh, that was just discussed. 
So we have uh, what I'll kind of put in a bucket of guaranteed money, money from settlements that have already been agreed to, uh, structured payments have already been uh, set, and in fact are already in a motion. We have received approximately a million dollars to date from these settlements. So I would take it, if you were to digest this chart, you have the total, which is the second column from the right, uh, year by year, what we expect to exceed, uh, receive, will receive, all the way through 2039, it appears, totaling just over $7 million if you take it to the bottom. The far right-hand column is the 25% incentive. You may recall that's a, an ad that the Opioid Abatement Authority is going to offer to localities who meet their so-called gold standard, which we are certain the county will, and we'll have more information on that program in January. But that's not the end of the funding. Uh, we know that there will be additional settlements coming down the pike. Uh, certainly the retailers, uh, CVS, Walgreens, Walmart, uh, will be settling litigation, we anticipate, and we'll be following similarly structured settlements where the locality, such as Henrico, will receive direct funding. And in addition to that, we have the state funding. So uh, a majority of the money from all of the settlements will go directly to the Opioid Abatement Authority, who will then further distribute the uh, money if you get down to the very bottom rung of this chart. 15% of their money will be reserved for cities and counties to compete uh, through grant funding. Projects involving multiple cities or counties, kind of regional funding, uh, uh, we can compete for. State agencies have a bucket and 35% is unrestricted, which will also be up for uh, competition. And uh, County staff is certainly in the competitive spirit and will be looking to bring forward projects that uh, will be competitive in receiving uh, these buckets of funding. And so, I'll turn it back to Laura Toddy to take us into our ideas for uses of that phone. So as you make this transition, Laura, I also um, remind the board, we've been allocating funding to the task force for several years. We've been carrying all that money forward. I realize it's one-time money, but what do we have in the bank now? We have just over a million dollars. Okay. So you have a lot of flexibility as far as you know, one time, recurring, and that's not even talking about any other additional general fund dollars that you allocate. So you're in a good position going into this from a financial standpoint. Thank you for being so uh, diligent with those dollars. Absolutely. So uh, one of the things we know that works is our, our peer recovery specialist, and peers have a really a, a very unique position in, um, in being able to work with individuals that are recovering from substance use and, and mental health. So with me today, and I, we could sit up here and talk about it all day long, but with me today I have William Pye. William has um, been working with us for three years, and he is going to talk about a little bit about his story, but, and, but more about what the benefit of a peer is. William? All right, thank you, Laura. <coughs> Excuse me. Good morning, good morning. Um, so uh, again, briefly, my name is William Pye. Um, yeah, I guess I, I'm going to make this brief. Thank you for letting me. Uh, staying here and share my story. Um, starting from the front end to the back end, um, you know, I was a standout football player at Verona High School. Um, while working on my craft on the field, I was also working on my addiction. Um, it started off with me with the gateway drugs. I went from alcohol to the marijuana to the cocaine to the heroin. Um, Having a substance abuse disorder, I lost a lot. Um, I lost my freedom a couple of times. Um, I lost time with my family, sons. Um, you know, um, I lost trust from family members, friends. Um, you know, I, I tell when I and I tell my story. I, I say, um, incarceration this time helped save my life. Um, we, we talk about the, the programs, you know. I entered a program, the RISE program, then I also went to um, enter the Orbit program as well to where it helped me resurface that structure and accountability that I was lacking when I was in active addiction. Um, upon um, my incarceration, while I was incarcerated, um, I was blessed to be able to go out to um, different high schools in the area 
and talk to the student body. Um, when I was released, I was blessed to be able to first go part-time with Franco Mental Health, um, then became full-time to where um, I offer revived trainings to our clients, um, to the community. Um, I'm part of our OBAT team. Um, I reach out to our OBAT clients weekly to offer peer support. Um, I'm part of Addiction Tax Force as well. Um, also, um, weekly, I have a group with the men and women of uh, the jail, the orbit program. You know, I guess I can sit here and talk for 20, 30 minutes. Um, you know, but I, I do feel and we feel that peers are very important uh, to this field. Um, you know, to just to kind of summarize what I'm saying, you know, um, peers offer a unique thing in this field because we can share our experience, strength, and hope. Um, I, can, I can't turn to page 36 and say, hey, this is what this was. I can say I lived this. Um, I can give you different pieces to the puzzle and you put your puzzle together. We all know that um, recovery speaks many, many different languages. And I can share my pathway to recovery. And again, I say the spring strength and hope because I was there, them lonely nights, uh, them tough days, and I'm here today. Um, so again, thank you for letting me share. Um, I don't hold too much of the time because I, I keep talking because I can go on with this because it's a passion. So um, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pye. It's also important to say that, that William told you about his efforts with the Addiction Task Force. He is an important voice in the room. And um, almost weekly, I'm at a meeting where William's there, not just contributing, but giving us ideas that push us in, in different directions. And, and it's phenomenal. I mean, it's phenomenal listening to um, his passion, and his passion really motivates the room. Um, one of the things that, that you heard William say was incarceration saved my life. And we know that incarceration is not the answer to the issues that we're presented with. We know it's a little bit of a cliche, but it, is, it does merit saying again that we can't jail our way out of these problems. Uh, but what we also know is that many people like William are going to spend times uh, in jail and what our efforts are focused on is trying to make that time productive so that we can have more stories like William when he stands up. And, and the sheriff has had a Herculean task over the past few years of dealing with all the issues that, that were created by external factors. Um, but now's a time to, to take this point in time, to take the resources that we can get out of these opiate settlements and give her more that she can work with so that we can create more success stories like William. So that's what I want to talk about for the next few minutes. Um, what we want to do as a part of this project is to build upon the successes that the sheriff already has. She's got three programs, and we'll talk about in a second, RISE, Orbit, and the MAT program. Um, we want to build upon those programs. We want to add two positions to the jail staff, one for Jail East and one for Jail West, uh, that are recovery plan coordinators. And I'll explain that to you in a few minutes. And we want to develop the ability to uh, evaluate inmates when they enter the jail and start working on a recovery plan and a recovery plan to be coordinated. You heard Ms. Toddy speak of that, about that with her group that work with Henrico Mental Health. Um, but she told you that's a small number because, quite frankly, she doesn't have the staff, she doesn't have the bandwidth uh, to provide those services to everybody. So we've got to take upon the successes that we've seen with some of these programs and try to blow them up by bringing different staff in there to work on things. So the sheriff and I have worked on, on this plan together, um, and this is what how we want to start this process uh, with adding in some additional resources. So rather than waiting 
uh, when somebody enters the jail, we want to start the evaluation process at the onset and have a professional sit down um, with, with a new inmate who's battling substance use disorder and talk, about, talk to them about what their needs are, talk to them about their health care needs, talk to them about their history, figure out why it is that we keep seeing this person again and again and again coming into the court system. Take that information, refer that information to one of the new recovery plan coordinators, uh, have that recovery plan coordinator gather the information, be familiar with the resources in the community, and then talk to other folks involved that are part of the team to gain more background information. I would submit to you, and I know I said this to you uh, about a month ago, that the background work that we do in this county, first of all, is unlike anybody else. The communication between the sheriff's office, the police, fire, and Rico Mental Health, uh, everyone in the Commonwealth Attorney, everyone involved, uh, to provide sort of a picture as to who this person is drives some of the success we see. Uh, it is a new concept. It's not a concept that, that I've seen modeled anywhere else. It's not a concept that we learned about training. It's one that we developed organically, but it's working. It's working because we're making sure that we know what the background issues are on people and trying to connect them in the right place. So upon gathering that information, the background information, combining with the intake evaluation, combining it with knowledge of, of what exists in the community, the recovery plan coordinator then develops that recovery plan for that inmate. Now that recovery plan, based on what the judge does, what's going on in the court system, what the history is, that recovery plan may generate jail-based programming. And I'm gonna talk about the jail-based programming in a minute. We may even get uh, inmates in jail that say, you know what? I don't want to get out. I want to participate in, in the program that the sheriff has. Uh, but either way, that's, a, that's an arrow in the quiver. That's, that's a resource for the recovery plan to work with. And then the last step, the most important step, um, as, as Ms. O'Bannon referenced, is that release into the community with support. That will distinguish us with what we're doing. There are resources in our community. We need to make sure people are going to the right resources. They're going to the right place with the right connections and the right people are making those connections. So this is a, an evolution of a concept that we think will have success. And to follow up with what I said to you before, Ms. O'Bannon, I really want to continue with tracking the data so that we know after six months, one year, five years, if this approach is working and if it's not working, let's adjust on the fly. So the sheriff has programs, and, and she and her staff, uh, Ms. Debbie Morton, who I know is watching online, uh, oversees many of the programs. Uh, and and they, are, they have done, again, an amazing task through the past couple years and, and are getting these programs back on track. track. So RISE, uh, created under the previous sheriff, but now is vibrant again. Um, is a program operated through the jail. It has three phases. It is peer run with support from Enrico Mental Health. Uh, currently there are 92 participants in the program, 67 male, 25 female. Uh, one of the exciting concepts that this is the sheriff's idea that I stole, but I'm gonna present to you, um, is developing a program post rise that she wants to call rise above, and it's developing life skills. So we go through the initial phase of addressing addiction, addressing why we're there. Um, then let's take it to the next part. We're, we're gonna work with you before you go back out on the street so that you know how to balance your checkbook, you know how to pay your rent, you know how to, to interview for a job, you know how to look for the resources that will enhance and bring people back in. And I know William would agree if he stood up here and said that, that that's the biggest uh, drop off in many of the approaches that have happened in the past. All that we do to try to assist and get out of the lifestyle falls apart if somebody walks out of jail and has nowhere to go and has no job and has no way to support their family. So rise above can be a huge step in, in taking that next step in transitioning. Um, and, and there is a need for more peer assistance and, and there is a need, a need for more folks like William to continue working with that. You're gonna see several pictures uh, on the screen of folks that are participating either in orbit or in rise and it's, it is worth, mo worth noting that they have signed releases and they are proud of the steps that um, they have taken and want people to see these pictures and want people to know the progress that they've made. Um, medication assisted treatment is a new, uh, a new step, a new exciting uh, ability to connect folks in jail um, with 
assistance that they haven't gotten in the past. In fact, this is the new evolution uh, in this field. Um, the idea is to use a medical approach to use medication uh, if available and use that to bridge folks inside the jail to outside the jail. Doesn't do a lot of good if we use medication while somebody's inside the jail to help curb the cravings, to help get them in, in a posture where they don't want to be using drugs anymore and then they're released out on the street and the medication evaporates. Uh, so the recovery plan coordinator working with some grant funding that already exists one of the roles will be to connect folks in the jail engaging in the MAT program so that when they get out, that bridge already exists. They know where to go. We've already got funding streams set up. They can continue the progress that they're making through the medical industry uh, to progress towards sobriety and to continue in sobriety. Um, the sheriff is in the, in the process of developing two pods at Jail West. Um, that will combine the beginning, the genesis of putting folks in MAT with an educational process, with the skills that we're talking about, with, uh, with learning the lessons, with being able to make that transition out on the street, not only with a medical provider to, to connect, but also with support that we need, that we know is so important. Um, lastly is the ORBIT program. You're going to see two slides, and again, I'm going to show you um, pictures of folks that are very proud of the work that they've done. Um, as you see on the left side of the screen, these are two former ORBIT participants, and, and the gentleman is now a regional operations manager uh, at, at the paper company that he works at. This is a, a family that's been strengthened by our efforts, and this is what we want to accomplish. I think, Mr. Thornton, you and I talked a few weeks ago about the ripple effect of the work that we do on the community and, and how sometimes that's not measurable, how sometimes numbers don't reflect it, but you know, on a long-term plan, if we can rebuild families, as you see in the picture, we can affect and improve our entire community. Orbit currently has 25 active participants, 22 males and three females. Again, this is a, a project and a program that was impacted greatly by the pandemic and, and is now as a result of the efforts of the sheriff's office really getting itself into its groove again. Um, Orbit is not restricted, even though the opiate is in the title, it's not restricted to opiate-related charges. We have moved past that. We are looking at addiction as a whole, not, not focusing on the drugs anymore. Um, Orbit participants make good workers. You're going to see these two bullet points again on the next slide. We've made connections with public works, with rec and parks, with public utilities, and Orbit, as Mr. Pye has wanted to do, Orbit participants uh, are beginning to fill public speaking engagements, going out to the community, as he talked about from his Orbit experience a few years ago, and trying to reach the next generation, be it kids in school or be it folks that are, uh, that are walking the steps that Mr. Pye walked in his life. Um, so I don't need to repeat myself again, but just another slide to show you um, the benefit that the county as a whole is receiving by these folks. And again, they, were, they are more than proud to have their pictures taken and show that where they've come from and where they are now. So, Mike, before we transition, uh, uh, Sheriff, will you come up? I ask the Sheriff, this is impromptu, but... Uh, there is a, a lot that the sheriff has done with the uh, topic that Mike just covered uh, regarding uh, workers that we have been able to uh, bring on. And I want to thank you personally for, um, for those efforts. But can you just talk to the board? You know, you mentioned the other day that, what, 70% of the uh, jail population has some sort of mental health issue? Yes. Um. And therein lies the struggle, mm -hmm. the, the dual diagnosis, right? You got mental health disorders and then you have the substance use disorder. And so for a lot of our efforts, um, the sober living homes, the recovery homes, the outpatient, day patients, a lot of them struggle with being able to get into those programs. Um, and for them, it's a struggle being incarcerated because in our judicial process, you must be able to um, participate in that process you must be competent to stay in trial. And for a lot of them, when they come to us, they're not, they're not stable. They're, they're not um, able to take part in the judicial process. Hence, for nuisance crimes, trespassing, um, trespassing after being forbidden, petty larceny, they spend an, an immense amount of time inside our facilities 
because they can't participate in the process and they don't qualify for some of the programs that we are um, starting to, to develop and, 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 and already have in place. So we have been overrun um, with this issue that we were not designed or set up to manage and handle. You know, I, I'm grateful that we have our CI team, CIT team and we work with um, all of our partners um, in the county. But this issue is becoming overwhelming. I know a lot of people and we are focused and now we have everybody's full attention in reference to substance use disorder. But the mental health crisis is starting to creep up and far exceed um, what we're seeing with just simple substance use disorder. So um, you've been meeting with board members and members of the General Assembly. Yes to carry this conversation forward. The problem that we have at the state is that at the very, under the very best scenario, additional capacity comes about in 2026. And that's just not, that's a long time. And so I brought you up here because I, I think we've had media monitoring, um, you know, these meetings and listening in and I don't know, I don't want to over, overstep or overspeak, but going for in this legislative session, there is no specific ask that the county has except that we're asking the state to, to do what they need to do to make sure 2026 is not acceptable. Yeah. We cannot continue at 70% of all of our folks in jail being having mental health issues. We can't spend $15,000 every day of every weekend on police overtime, taking full platoons out. So at a certain point, ridiculous is ridiculous. Right's right and wrong's wrong. So the ask is do your job. And I, I, I don't know if I'm overstating that, and I certainly hope I'm not punchy on the last meeting of the last day of the retreat, but um, I wanted, I wanted that to be on the record. But what, can, what could we ask? Would we be asking for more workers, more deputies, or more mental health workers? We need, we need the, the, the state to do what it had done for years mm -hmm. when it comes to mental, mental health. health. Hey, Laura, you want to come up? Because, okay. I mean, she, is the, she leads the whole state. We're going to meet with the General Assembly members, all the members of the board, at some time in the next month or so. So. You know, a, a real part of this is a lack of hospital beds for individuals yeah. who need inpatient treatment. And so what happens when there's no bed, if they have a charge, you know, they're, they're going to jail. And the acuity, the, the, the sheriff, I, you know, really I think is understating. The acuity level of the individuals in the jail is incredible. Um, so you have folks that are in court that, that um, really cannot, she is co absolutely correct, cannot participate in the court proceedings. And, and, mm -hmm. um, and if it was a, you know, any other time, they would be in a psychiatric hospital getting care, um, not in the jail. And so one of the things that we've had to do, and, and the sheriff has been gracious to, to help us support this, is we've increased the, the, uh, a nurse practitioner to be able to prescribe medications for individuals because we are so um, overwhelmed with the number of folks that need mental health treatment in the jail. But hospital beds, if the, the, during the pandemic, and it's, it's the same way everywhere, you know, there's, there's not enough workers in our state facilities. Um, and so they reduce the number of beds. There are still over 250 beds that are offline, that were online um, okay. prior to the pandemic. And, and this is not something, this was started before the pandemic, uh, but it has absolutely um, exacerbated the situation. Okay. And I know I've said this before, but I've had a group of uh, years ago and recent, a couple years ago and 10 years ago, um, a couple of groups of psychiatrists would come to me and say, we need more mental health pediatric beds in your area. That was what their specific cause was. And they couldn't get past, I know I've said it before, but the certificate of need, you know, so they were, but you're saying there already are beds available at state facilities? Well, but no, there were, there were reductions off. that were made. Reductions. So okay. let me put it in mm -hmm. just very recent, very, and this is, this is going to be hard for some of you. Mm -hmm.
Chair, if we had an individual, so when, when Laura Toddy says, jail is not the place for certain people, certain individuals with certain conditions that are going through a court case that they don't understand, we had an individual that was doing what? And don't hold anything back. So I was trying to be nice because it is early in the morning and um, I can be kind of forward and bold in sharing because this has become the norm and a part of my life and it shouldn't be. But this gentleman was actually um, ice skating in his feces in, in a watch cell. Now how, what do you do? You know, I have a staff that's trained in corrections and yes, we have mental health training but like, what do you do for this person? You Because he doesn't belong in jail. Because he doesn't belong in jail, but he also doesn't belong in the community either. You know, I've had parents contact me and they're dealing with a loved one before they're incarcerated and they are struggling and they cannot get resources and help for their loved ones. And eventually, sad to say, they end up having to contact our law enforcement, the police department, multiple times. And in the end, for most of them, jail becomes the most humane option. That just can't be. Yeah. So I, I just, what, what do we do? I don't know. I, I tell you, I'm so grateful to, to you all for your support, to Henrico Mental Health, to the police department, to the fire department. We all touch, this, this touches all of us, our schools. You think about a lot of these people have family. Some of them have children. And so like the tentacles to this problem, just we touch so many people. So my thing is we in Henrico County, we don't stand by and do nothing. And a lot of time we step out and do without help from others, but we need help. And the state and the federal government mm -hmm. needs to figure out, just like we sit here and have these meetings, figure out something to do. 2026 is not gonna help me and my staff. It is hard to get people to want to come into law enforcement because the law enforcement is not the same as it was years ago, not when I got into law enforcement. You know, we can throw money at it, but until we start dealing with the problems that we have and utilizing the right resources for those problems, we are gonna to continue to struggle and have problems in law enforcement, in mental health, in all of these professions because we are managing and handling problems that we were not set up to handle. Can I, um, Madam Chair, I just, I read an article this morning and we, um, my, well, one of the persons that I, I was assigned to sit down with with our team, with Sheriff and Chief English and um, with Chief of Staff, Tatina, the County Manager, and who else was in there? Was that it? Eric Lebo. And uh, um, Mr. Lebo, um, Sheriff shared that suggestion. And one of the things that I struggle, well, let me start here. I just read a story this morning, People Magazine, a 10 year old boy killed his mother. He wanted a um, virtual reality set, mm -hmm. one of those little goggle things. And um, she told him no. So he got her key, unlocked her, whatever, her gun cabinet, took the gun out, shot her in the eye, 10 years old. Mm -hmm. He's being charged with murder, being held, without, being held with a bond. Um, you read it, it sounds vicious, but then when you start looking at the details, this 10-year-old boy has been given off all kinds of signs throughout his entire life of mental health um, red flags. Mm -hmm. And if he had gotten the help, maybe. We don't know if he would have ended up in this situation. I think this is the, this is the struggle of this. Um, you know, everybody doesn't have it, the empathy nor care. Um, you know, I just think lock him up, put him in jail, um, and I think a part of when you go back and look at our jail numbers five years ago, 10 years ago, that's why we were talking about building another jail. When hopefully at this point we all realize that building another jail is not the answer. We need more mental health treatment, more mental health support, 
Um, but I don't think our elected of, of, um, officials on the state level get it because it's all about politics. And, you know, politicians suck sometimes, I'm gonna be honest, when they are politicians and they don't care about humans. This is why I wanna be, this is why I like being on this board. I don't wanna be in the state government for this very reason, because it's Democrat, Republican, 51, 49 in the Senate, 52, 48 in the House, and you have, you have to, you have to give your soul up to go with your party and not vote on stuff with your heart. So I'm hoping, um, you know, I don't know whether or not our meetings with the individual legislators are gonna make a difference. We're meeting with the state, we're meeting with the, with the House reps, um, but at the end of the day, it comes down to a hard line. Do you feel like people that commit crimes need to be in jail regardless of what their mental health situations are and if that's the way you feel, then that's what we're gonna get the situations that we get with people ice skating on their own crap. And, um, you know, it's just a horrible situation. Now I'm praying that somebody gets a soul so that we can do what's right to help human beings out. Um, Sheriff, I, I wanna ask you a question and I, I know the answer. Having someone with a, a mental illness in a jail is not safe for staff and other inmates and the person themselves, correct? Correct. All of the uh, central state, there's no room. So what we end up having is our police officers, you heard the manager mention, uh, we can have a whole platoon taken out simply because they have to be there at Henrico Doctors to, to take care of them. Uh, in, in my meeting with the delegate, uh, when we were told, well, there's gonna be a bunch of state money put into hiring more people. And I said that that's not the answer because we can't get more people. How are you gonna get more people? Uh, and in that conversation, I think the sheriff uh, and some others said, why don't you work with the private sector and open beds up so we then have places to, to reduce our uh, population in the jail yes. and, and give people what they actually need, help. So, uh, sheriff, I know you're, you're, you climb a mountain every day but thank you for what you're doing. And uh, I think if we all bring to all of the state delegates' attention that this is something that needs to be handled and we, we will, of course, keep doing what we do. So thank you for everything you do. Thank you. I, I'm, I'm just encouraged that we are now having open, honest conversations, mm -hmm. you know. Um, like Reverend Nelson alluded to, sometimes in politics, um, our judgment gets clouded because of alliances we feel like we have to um, be holding to. But this is a people problem. These people aren't affiliated. We don't, we don't ask what your political affiliation is when we encounter you for a service. Mm -hmm. You know, it is about taking care of people, you know, and until we start making that our focus, which is supposed to be our focus, um, we're gonna continue, well, other folks, not in Henrico, um, are gonna continue to struggle. But unfortunate for us, we are our own worst uh, enemy sometimes because, because we are the gold standard and because we um, do things so well, we also um, become a magnet for other people's problems, because I dare say if you look at our jail population, um, quite a large portion are residents of um, other jurisdictions. And for some, um, they utilize that and call on us and divert their people to our jurisdiction just because they know that we're going to do something. Doing nothing is not an option in Henrico. So, I'm grateful. Thank you for um, having the conversations and I'm hopeful that we will um, soon see an improvement.
Thank you very much. And this is information that I've, I've obviously been taking notes, but I've been taking it um, to try to get it to a different level. But Ms. Toddy, the only reason I mentioned that about the psychiatrist, you said there are 250 beds that are now offline. Where are they offline? If, if, if that is something we can aim a delegate to or something like that, there, would that be helpful? It, it would. It's, it is mm -hmm. the state facilities, and they took them offline because they didn't have enough staff. The um, okay. governor has just um, started a new task force. They had their first meeting yesterday uh, around looking at hospital beds. So I think it is on his agenda, um, and uh, hopefully there'll be some, some movement around that. When we get back to the politics of it, that's what I'm trying to get is on Correct. the train to push. So, okay. So, and I want to go back and just, since I have the clicker, I okay. take a little uh, privilege here, um, mm -hmm. and just answer your other question around juveniles. Mm -hmm. um, so one of the things that we are doing is we're looking at alternatives to hospitalization because we, we really can't count on that. And one of the things we've been able to do with a, a grant and a partnership with St. Joseph's Villa is to develop a 23-hour program for um, for children and adolescents, and that, that program is in the, the building out stages. Uh, we are also talking about crisis stabilization programs and a 23-hour a program for adults. So it just gives you a, a, another alternative to hospitalization to be able to develop a plan um, where we can keep folks in the community and build the support around them. And that's, that's the ideal, um, so we, we don't have to depend on others. I have been asked to go to the final slide um, and uh, the summary, um, and since we've had that robust conversation, which is um, really, I, I really appreciate your interest and, and willingness to, to, um, to go that way. So this is in summary what we're asking with the opioid uh, abatement funds. We're asking for two positions with the sheriff's office um, to really help with the, the um, recovery planning. Uh, we want to enhance our programming in jail. We want additional peer support specialists, um, and we want them throughout the county in many different places. We had talked about, in, with the Recovery Roundtable, the creation of a, a division director for substance use. I uh, feel like that this is the time to really bring that on. We, have, we don't want to become siloed. We are doing this in so many places in the county, and we really need, and it's a part of, of everybody's job, but it's not one person's job. And we think by having that, that vested interest that we would have um, greater outcomes. Uh, we have done a lot around community outreach. We know that not everybody can come in to receive our services that we need to get out in the community and be able to offer services, so want to continue to grow there. Um, and, um, and really look at the, the gaps in treatment funding. So one example I'll just share is um, around our, our psychiatrists, our prescribers. Uh, you know, we have a really, uh, uh, at this moment, I'm going to knock on wood, we are fully staffed with, um, with prescribers, so nurse practitioners um, and, and psychiatrists. Um, but there's always room for more, and we have some part-time folks that, that we could do some additional hours, especially around our office-based um, addiction treatment program. What we want to look at in the future is looking at mobile health care, um, looking at programs and housing for parenting and pregnant women, um, and looking at a peer-managed recovery center. That is our presentation. I'll be glad to answer, or anybody on the team will be glad to answer any questions. Any more questions from members of the board? Or comments? Or? Quite an interesting presentation. We touched all of it, and I very much appreciate it. This is Thank something you. that I think if you choose one or two things, it would be educating children and, and um, helping people with addiction. I mean, if you had the top couple that you would list. So, um, Mr. Manager, this is a wrap up, and I was wondering if each member of the board would wanna take a minute, and well, I'm certainly gonna, I can start off with thanking everyone for being here, and I know there's some that aren't here today that were here yesterday, and we really appreciate everything, and um, I particularly like the, our new um, R3, <laughs> That was a very interesting moment. And, 
and it kept us on our toes. I mean, we're trying very hard to follow everything everybody's doing, and each department has so much that they're working on that this opportunity, Mr. Manager, gives us, it gives us these days, give us this opportunity to truly understand what's going on in the county. And I thank everybody for going through this details, these detailed explanations, because um, this is something I feel is absolutely necessary to understand how the, the whole system works together, like the cogs of the wheel that you see in a computer program when it's telling you that this is um, a process that needs to happen. So did someone want to start off? Because I could keep talking but <laughs> and thanking. Does anybody want to say something? Okay. Madam, Madam Chair, I'm happy to, to I appreciate the opportunity. I'd, I certainly, I'll, I'll the thanks are shared among us all, so I'll, I'll reiterate what you said there. But Mr. Manager and members of our staff, I'd like to talk about this process just for a second. You know, we, we, we gather here together to do this annually, and I think it's an incredible initiative. And I think it's something that I'm not sure if all jurisdictions do it, and I think they should, but, you know, sometimes we compare ourselves to other jurisdictions, and sometimes um, there's no need because you focus on yourself and you do it the right way you think you do it. But... We gather like this in March for budget reviews. We gather like this here in December, January for a retreat. And it's an opportunity for us really to, to share thoughts, to hear thoughts, to hear initiatives and share our thoughts. And I, I, I just applaud this county for doing it, number one. Number two, I'd like to see it continue um, and even continue to develop as we continue to improve our processes. You know, today we heard so much, right? And we, we you know, I had this list right in front of us. We. We heard from our housing folks and we heard about our hotel motel challenges, which I think the sheriff just touched on it. Some of these things touch so many different departments, right? We just heard from the sheriff's department, we heard from mental health, we heard from, uh, I mean, the hotel motel thing touches three, four, five different departments. And I think these are opportunities to discuss those things. And sometimes just in conversation, results come out and sometimes it takes longer just to continue to have those conversations without immediate results, but continue to continued discussion. I think that's as important. Um, we don't have enough time to discuss all the things that, you know, Mr. Manager, you make an effort to discuss these things with us on a daily basis, every single day on the phone, you're having those conversations with me. So I can only assume that you're having it with all of us and managing the staff. And I know your division directors, your deputies are having those conversations with staff, but these opportunities allow us to have that conversation, not one-on-one -on, -one on the phone, and not passing in a hallway, but to have it where everybody can hear. And you mentioned earlier that you, you thanked everybody yesterday for being here, even when it wasn't their department. And I think that's key too, because the full picture is what we're trying to get after here. So, you know, I want to say thank you for the efforts and we cover so much and we know we didn't cover police, Mr. Nelson and I were talking about, we didn't cover police or fire or sheriff's office directly in any of these presentations, but golly, did we not touch on all of them, right? So. Yeah. I guess that's my point. It's the collaborative effort of these opportunities to sit down are so valuable. And I, I certainly want to applaud it and ask that they continue to become more robust and more, um, more available to us. Thank you. Uh, as I said in a meeting uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, you guys are the reason that this county runs the way it does. The, uh, with, with this sort of sit down, it is amazing to be on this side and hear ideas and, and programs we could launch and, and then watch over two or three years, it blossom. It is, it is absolutely remarkable. Um, and that's, that's you guys, truly, that's you guys. Uh, I, I applaud everything that we're moving forward with uh, coming out of this retreat. I think it's all critical and, and it is absolutely what makes Henrico, Henrico. So thank you to the deputy managers, of course, Carrie and John, and to all of the staff that dedicate to make Henrico a better place. Thank you.
Uh, I'd like to follow in the footsteps of uh, Mr. Brandon and also uh, thank uh, our staff, and particularly we have one of the most outstanding county managers, you know, uh, around. Um, <clears throat> but what is so significant for me about this is refreshing as we kind of take a look at what are some of the critical areas we need to take a look at in the county and to kind of see how we can uh, find solutions and solving many of these things. So again, uh, we want to thank all of you who attended this. Uh, I'm sure you, all of us could have been doing something else, but this is very significant. And also we had uh, the public, uh, Mr. Mr. Manager, right, that uh, had a chance to kind of view and listen to uh, what we were saying and all of that. Uh, in conclusion, though, you know, Henrico has always uh, been a stellar locality. And one of the things I've learned is that sometimes if you're going to ask someone to do something, don't get a person that's uh, inactive. Get a person who's involved. So I say that as a lead-in to uh, the locality with this caption about the Henrico Way. Um, we want to look at all those things we've covered, all those things we've covered in here, and that's going to take time. But I also want to add something to the list. I think, number one, we need to uh, start providing more data on schools and uh, uh, government initiatives. Um, we need to watch land. Uh, as you know, they're not making them on land. And so we want to start looking at building buildings up. That's very important. Um, I, I'm concerned about also redefinition of SWAM. We need to kind of redefine that a little bit because I don't know whether or not that gives us the data we, we, we need to have. Uh, fourthly, let's reimagine also, colleagues, a reconfiguration of, um, of some type of a future historical museum in Henrico County. It's very important. And uh, at last, as Elder James brought out, uh, hey, since we are the leaders in the region, let's still think about this thing about incineration. That's really how we can help make this um, environment more pristine. Thank you, Ms. Madam Chair. Um, I, I want to uh, thank everybody as uh, thank everybody as well. County manager, thank you. Uh, deputy county managers, uh, the whole team, uh, upper level management, middle management, those who are working in the field. Uh, all of you make him right or who they are. Um, thank my colleagues for participating in these type of conversations and the community. One thing I've been doing, um, I told Mr. Smith yesterday, I should have hired some young person um, to. Uh, retweet everything for me and then post it on Facebook. I've been doing it myself. It's a job, so I'm going to have to hire somebody to do it next year. <clears throat> the beautiful thing about that, though, though is um, you get the involvement of the community that, that's not watching. So you're encouraging people to watch. Um, you know, so we, I get so excited about uh, things. Um, we posted about the Williamsburg Road corridor and roundabouts, and I, I posted it on the Sandston page, and uh, I've been getting slammed on it. So it's, um, it's, it, we get excited about it, but um, you know, I, you know, we said something about a roundabout on Sandston, and I mean, they just been killing me on it. Um, so, so we talk about all this stuff, but the people that live in the communities, they have. Um, you know, their voice matters. So some of the things that we've shared, we, I need to go back and look at, um, you know, but ultimately at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's all about the heart. So uh, I, I really think that we have the, one of the greatest teams around here. We are, we're diverse, um, we're nimble, and I would put our, um, I would put our upper management team against any other region. Um, I mean, any other government in this, in this region and the state. Um, we just have some incredible people that work for us, and they continue to just try to stay on the cutting edge of stuff. Some things that, um, that we do work, some things that we try, 
um, we need to take back to the drawing board. But at the end of the day, um, we continue to be a place where people generally um, are pleased living here. So um, I think that's all we can ask. So thank you, guys. Thank you. Now, Mr. Manager, you don't call me every day. You call Mr. Uh, Schmidt. <laughs> uh, I just wanted to mention when we leave here, we all have apparently, we've all had lists that we've made. And uh, I've certainly got a couple here, and I'm, I'm going to pass some of these directly to the manager. But um, just to remember that at this event, as we've heard before, uh, we put our foot on the gas pedal. So we're, we're moving forward. We're going to get there, and we're hopefully going to touch on all the things that everybody here has said. So, Mr. Manager, did you want to sum us up? No, Finish I just want to say to everyone, you all crushed it. So thank you. I certainly hope everyone has a great weekend. Um, I am going to ask Chief English, Chief Auten, and Mike Feinmel. I just need you all for a minute, okay? Thank you all. Highland Springs plays at 3 o'clock today. I need all of you guys to pray that we beat Stonebridge. Thank you. With no further business, okay. We are adjourned. Thank you.